Also, if you want to follow along, uh, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. We'll be there this morning as we uh, continue in our series talking about how Jesus serves. Uh, We talked a few weeks ago about how on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus served through washing his disciples' feet and asked us to be people who serve practically like he did, that he continued in that conversation to talk about how he serves by giving us the Holy Spirit and putting power within us that then the hope is that we would use to testify to the world about who Jesus is. Last week, we saw how Jesus serves by giving us the gift of peace and that he wants to be us to be able to be full of his peace as we serve the world around us. And this morning, we're going to see how Jesus prays for us and what he prays for us. It's a way that Jesus serves us is in his prayers. This prayer, particularly as John records it in John chapter 17, is is unique in the way that, that Jesus is praying. This isn't a time where he's teaching about prayer. He hasn't been asked a question and is responding with a prayer. He's done that some other times in scriptures. Maybe the most famous of those is where he gives us the Lord's Prayer after the disciples. We should pray, Jesus says, pray this. This is what you should say when you pray. And many of us have memorized that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we often recite it, maybe pray that. And when we do so, it's deeply meaningful. And yet because we've memorized it and said it so many times, sometimes can feel routine. Whether it's that prayer or not, some of us may recognize in our own lives that sometimes when we pray, it feels more like discipline than it feels like our heart's intimate connection with God. I'll give some examples from my own life. When my family prays before a meal, it's often our daughter who leads us in that prayer, and she often prays the exact same thing she's prayed for every other meal she's ever prayed for. And while it's sincere, and while it is for God, And while it connects us to him, it often feels rote and routine more than it feels like an authentic heart's cry. Maybe you've experienced that in other places in your life. I'll give another example. Uh, Three times today, I've already prayed for an offering. Over the course of my life in ministry, I have thousands of times prayed for an offering that was about to be received. And while it is an authentic prayer every time, it's an honest prayer every time, it is for God, and I assume he hears and moves because of it every time. If you've paid attention, you'll recognize that the words kind of flow pretty naturally off of my tongue because I've said them thousands of times. It comes across fairly similar every time, and at times feels more like a public prayer or a teaching of how to pray, then it feels like an authentic heart cry to God. What we're going to see in John 17 isn't Jesus teaching about prayer. It's an offering words that people could memorize to pray to God. It's his heart's cry. His heart's cry for himself, his heart's cry for the disciples that are there with him in the moment, and his heart's cry for us, the disciples who will believe that he prays for. And we'll see that, and we'll see that as very different. No No different than when I have different prayers. I have prayers that are far more my heart's cry. They often take place while I'm driving, when I'm alone, and I'm asking God for something that I know will only happen in my life if he's at work. I pray sincerely for those things. Some examples of what those looks like. I pray consistently for God to give me a heart for others, particularly my neighborhood, because I wouldn't have one otherwise. It is easy in this world for my flesh to make life want to be about me. And so I pray and ask God for a heart for others, both in my neighborhood and around the world, an awareness of their needs and a heart to help uh, present truth and life and love to them. As a pastor, the most consistent prayer I pray for my job is that God would give me his heart of love for you all and for the community that surrounds this church. Because it's easy for me to make my job a task list, to show up and perform duties and use skills and to miss who God has called me to be. And so I pray consistently, knowing it won't happen without him, that God would give me his heart of love for the people I pastor. It's a very different prayer when I'm praying that than when we're praying before dinner at my house. 
Maybe you can recognize some of those kinds of differences in prayer for yourself as well. And so today, I simply want to go verse by verse through John chapter 17. We'll spend our entire morning doing that, except for the like five minute tangent. I'm going to go on here near the beginning as like a theology lesson. Here's how Jesus begins that prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might be given might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus recognizes in his prayer that God has given him authority, and he's given him the authority over extending eternal life to people. We'll see in a moment how he prays, recognizing that his disciples are aware of this now, that he has a unique authority. But there's this strange phrase there at the end of verse 2, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given that's one of the ways uh, that Jesus uses some words to talk about who's going to be saved, who's going to have life in the kingdom of God. There's other ways that's talked about throughout scripture. They're not going to come up on the screen, but I want to read another uh, style of language that's used to talk about those who will be saved. This is Paul's words in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Paul writes it this way. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Jesus uses language to say, I'll give eternal life to those who the Father has given to me. Paul uses language to say that God foreknew and predestined people, that he called them, justified them, glorified them, that it's a work of God, that those things have happened. Throughout the rest of Scripture, it's roughly 20 times that there's a word used about the people who are saved. God calls them the elect. This is the moment of our theology lesson. I'm going to put some words up on the screen, some theological words that just simply say uh, unconditional election and conditional election. And they come from those verses. Paul's use of the word elect and other New Testament authors used of the word elect to talk about God's people. And it, it brings insight on what do we think about when Jesus says God has given him some. What does that actually mean? And the truth is that for 2,000 years, people have disagreed. People have disagreed what it means to be elect. People have disagreed what the predestination and foreknowledge. People have disagreed about what it means that God the Father gave Jesus some. And so I want to just clarify a couple of those major positions, and then uh, we'll move on. Uh, back to Jesus' prayer. The first of those, I've just listed there the language unconditional election. This is language often used by a camp of theologians called Calvinists. It's a group of people who uh, prioritize God's sovereignty, his ability to do whatever he wants to do. And so when it comes to those who will be saved, uh, the language is is that God has elected those who will be saved, that God does the work of salvation and he has chosen, he foreknew and predestined the work for those who would be saved saved, and he did so without condition, hence unconditional. And what they mean by that, or what theology and uh, academics mean by that, is that uh, God didn't have an observable way by which we know who he would choose. God didn't, for instance, say, everybody that's born with blue eyes are the people that I'm going to elect, and they'll be my people. Or every man that's over six feet tall and every woman that's over five foot five. Those are the people I have elected. And there would be this observable way which we would be able to say, oh, that's who God chose. And we would know. No, there's no condition. There's no observable way by which we know who God elected to be saved. That God elected some to be saved, that they're saved, and that they essentially uh, don't have a choice in the matter. Not because God doesn't want to give them choice, but because of God's sovereignty and power. That if God is powerful enough to extend grace and new life into your life, you're not able to resist it. God's power is so overwhelming, it is irresistible. And so you couldn't deny what God is trying to do in your life. So if he foreknew and predestined you to be saved, you are saved because of God's choice. That's the sovereignty, Calvinistic understanding of these kinds of of verses that talk about these same kinds of things. On the other side of that, there's a camp of people who have read God's word and aim to interpret and believe God's word as best as they know how. Uh, the most uh, clear definition of them, if you want to do further research, is the Arminians. The Arminians would say, no, we believe that God is the one who saves. 
We believe that all of our salvation is dependent on what God does. We believe God has to choose us. We don't get to be the ones who are in charge of that. But they would imply and understand that there is a condition by which God has made those choices. His foreknowledge is part of that condition, and it's that God knew who would respond well to the grace extended to them. Who would choose to accept the gift of life that came from Jesus. And that the condition by which God elected people was the condition of those who would respond to his grace. And it would imply, while unclear in its definition, that we play a responding role in our salvation. I'm not going to get more clear than that. So if that's more confusing than helpful for you, I'm sorry. I understand that's a risk in trying to discuss in like five minutes what thousands of years of church history hasn't been able to agree upon yet. Different understandings of the same thing both of which agree we're only saved because of God. We don't earn it. We can't work ourselves into it. God alone saves. Disagreement on if and God picked all of that from the creation of the world or if God picked all of that knowing who, which of us would respond and that we have some level of response or responsibility um, in the way that we accept that grace. Throughout history, both of those have been prominent understandings of ways to uh, interpret what amounts to about 45 or so verses in Scripture that can be unclear for us to understand what that exact meaning is. And I want to be as clear as I can possibly be. And those camps still consider each other Christians. Calvins don't look at Arminians and say they're heretical. They may think they're wrong in interpreting some of these verses, but they don't think that's something worth dividing the, the kingdom of God over necessarily, that we can disagree on that while staying united in the faith together. Our denomination, for instance, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, when you go through the licensing process with them, so when I did that, when Pastor Nathan, Pastor Rob, Pastor Bruce, when we went through that licensing process, they ask us where we fall on this kind of spectrum. But they don't care the answer we give as long as we defend our answer biblically. Because church history has shown, we likely aren't going to come to one clear understanding of this until Jesus returns. Back into Jesus' prayer and off the theological tangent. Jesus then says what we have to agree on. Verse 3 as he's praying. Now this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what we have to get right. That's what we all have to agree on, that the work of salvation comes from God and God alone through Christ, that salvation is about knowing God through Jesus. Both the Calvinists and the Arminians believe that. That's what we have to get right. Jesus prays that we would get that right and prays that he would finish that work. I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, he says, as he anticipates his death and resurrection. And then praying lastly about himself, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus longs to return to a state where he was in perfect communion, love with God the Father and with the Holy Spirit, where the three of them together were one in perfect unity. Jesus says, I had that before creation. I even had it after creation and before I physically became present in the world. And he's longing to return to that. Return to me the glory in your presence. The glory I had with you before the world began. That's what he wants for himself. The return to perfect glory with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And then he turns from praying about himself to praying about the disciples that are there with him. And I'll make some application about that, about what it still means for us today. I think that's okay for us to do. But uh, let's remember that when Jesus is praying this next section, he's praying for the disciples that are there with him that day. He'll get to praying about us, the future disciples, in a moment. Jesus says this, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. Jesus is essentially saying, 
These disciples that are with me, they've watched me teach your word. They've watched me talk about your kingdom. And they've been able to observe that when I did so, it wasn't as just any other rabbi. It wasn't as just any other teacher. It came with an authority that the other rabbis and other teachers didn't have. And they started to believe and obey, not just that I was teaching the words well, but that I was doing so by words you gave me. That I was sent uniquely and differently, and they recognize that. They now know with certainty, Jesus prays, that I came from you. They believe that you have sent me. And then Jesus prays for them, those disciples. I pray for them, verse 9 says. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they're yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I'll remain in the world no longer, but they're still in the world that I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name that you gave me. No one has been lost except one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. As Jesus begins to pray for his disciples that he has spent the last years ministering with, the ones who believe he's sent by God and the Son of God, he prays most clearly and specifically for protection. God, I pray that you would protect them. Protect them so that they could be one as we're one. The end goal is that we would be one as God the Father and Christ the Son are one. And when he prays for that, he prays that we would be protected. Now, protection doesn't come from the removal of temptation, doesn't come from the uh, distancing from the world. It comes from the power of Christ's name itself. That we would be protected by the power of God, not by our own efforts. We protected not for our own comfort, but so that we could be one with the other believers. That's what he says as he's praying for his disciples. And then there's an end conclusion he hopes that would come from that. Verse 13, he continues, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Protect them so that they can be one and experience my full joy. Simple questions for us. Are we living as one with all of the other believers of God? Are we living out the fullness of God's joy in our lives? Simple questions, hard to do, I think that's why Jesus prays for them. Jesus prays for this because he knows it takes a work of God in our lives for it to happen. We won't be one in our own flesh. We won't experience the full measure of Christ's joy if we're trying to earn it by our own behaviors. It takes a work of God in our lives for us to be one and for us to experience joy. And that work will be combated by the world around us so much so that Jesus says we need to be under his protection for it. While God is at work in our lives, we need to rest under the protection of Christ's name. He continues. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus is talking about this protection, and, and he does so in the midst of saying, protection won't look like removal from the hard things of the world. I'm not taking them out of it. He says, I'm not even asking that you would do that. I'm asking that they would be protected from the evil one while they're in the world. He wants us in the world. This last week, uh, our denomination's district was having a conference. So our district was gathering our family of churches together and our pastors and leaders together to talk about what we as a movement are hoping to see happen in the world. And here's some of the kinds of language he uses consistently. He would say of every believer, because scripture says of every believer, and of every local church, that we should be light in darkness. 
that we should be bringing light to dark places and that our efforts should be put towards pushing back the darkness, that we should aim to see the spiritual climate around us change because of the way God works in and through us, that that's the mission God has given us as his followers. This is what Jesus is praying for. He's saying, I want my people to be protected, not to be removed completely from the darkness, but to walk into it, bringing light into it, pushing the darkness back, changing the spiritual climate of their lives, changing the spiritual climate of our homes, our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, that we would bring light where there's darkness and that we would push back the darkness with Jesus protecting us and working in and through us. That we'd be people in the world, not removed from it. Jesus talks then about what it looks like to stand against those kinds of temptations the world has to offer when we have to be present in the midst of them instead of having removed ourselves entirely from them. He says this, starting in verse 16, they're not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, that means separate them Make them holy, complete the work of God in them into the holy and righteousness that they're supposed to be. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus wants us, God wants us to be holy and righteous, free from sin conquering over any temptation that darkness or the world would put in front of us. But he makes clear that doesn't happen by us removing ourselves from the world. He sent us into the world. Our sanctification comes not from us managing our own behaviors. We would never find victory that way. Jesus, no, our sanctification has to come from the truth. It has to come from God's word. Specifically, it says it has to come from him that he is sanctifying himself, that it's out of him sanctifying himself, that we may to be sanctified. We are made holy not because of what we can do, not because of our behavior or sin management. We're made holy because of the power of Christ at work in us. It takes a move of God in our lives for it to happen. And that's why Jesus prays for it. Not that we would remove ourselves completely from the world but that we would engage, sent into the world like Jesus has asked us to be, to bring light into dark places and to change the spiritual climate. Here's what happens, though. We disagree on what that spectrum and balance looks like. What give and take we have with the world, what presence we have in it, and what we say no to from it, we will disagree on. Jesus is clear about that. Our experience has been clear about that. And yet the hope is that in the midst of those practical disagreements, in the midst of those church disagreements, in the midst of those occasionally theological disagreements on things that are tangential and not core to the gospel, that we would be able to disagree and still remain in complete unity. And Jesus moves from praying about those disciples there to praying about the future disciples, praying about people like you and me if you've given your life to Christ. Verse 20, he continues, my prayer is not for them alone, talking about those disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus says, I I pray not just for the disciples here with me now, but for all that will become believers because of the message they will continue to speak and preach. And if you're here and you've given your life to Jesus, that means he's praying for you in this moment. If you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus, you are off the hook for everything Jesus is about to say that we're supposed to do. But if you consider yourself a person of God, you've received the gift of salvation from Christ. He's praying for us. And he's praying again that we would be one. Just as he and the Father are one. And that we would do so, not as the end goal, but because that also helps in accomplishing his purpose, that the world may believe that Christ was sent by God. That we would be one so that the world may believe that the Father has sent Jesus. 
He expands on that a little bit in the next couple of verses, saying, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus wants us rooted in the love we have for him, rooted in the unity we have in him and in the Father, to be then completely united with each other. And because of that, then the world would see that Jesus came from God and that God loves them and be seen in our unity. And what that means is we, as individual believers who engage with other individual believers, that we as a local church, that we as part of the church around the globe, as God's people, would stop dividing ourselves into camps. We'd stop making we groups and they groups about what we tangentially agree on. That we'd stop saying, well, because I believe in unconditional election, I'm going to surround myself with those people and like those people and call they the people who disagree with me. We'd say, no, no, no. What we have to be in complete unity on is that eternal life is this, that we would know the one true God through Christ. And because of that, while we can disagree on other things, we won't divide ourselves into camps of we and they. That while we may choose for ourselves, diligently so with prayer and intention, what level of engagement with the world and distancing from the world is helpful for our sanctification and how we reach the world, well, that we will practically disagree on what that looks like, that we need to be able to practically disagree on what that looks like without creating we camps and they camps. We have to be completely unified with other believers, with our local church, with the church around the globe, whatever scope that is, Jesus prays that we would be brought to complete unity and that we would do so so that the world would know that God sent Christ and that the world would know that God loves them. That's an outcry, a response of our unity. And that is how Jesus says we would bring light to darkness change the spiritual climate of our homes, our workplaces, our schools, our neighborhoods, the globe. Him at work through us and our unity so that the world sees his love and sees that Christ came from him. He continues, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus wants us to be with him, to be present, to see the full uh, glory presented before creation and for all of eternity, and we will one day get to see that. As Jesus returns, we will get to see that completely. But until then, he promises us something different. As he prays again, righteous father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus wants us all to be filled with God's love and to be filled with Jesus' presence. That's what he prays for. Protection. So that we can be unified. Protection against the things the world will throw at us, against the things the evil one will throw at us. And that protection doesn't come by just setting boundaries against the world. That protection comes by the name of Christ at work in our life. In a way that helps us be completely unified. So the world can see and know and experience God's love. I don't know about you, but I want that to happen. Because I want the spiritual climate of my home to change. I want the spiritual climate of my neighborhood to change. I want the spiritual climate of the church to change. I want the spiritual climate of workplaces that you go to to change. I want the spiritual climate of your neighborhoods to change. I want the spiritual climate of Now Then or Ramsey or Elk River, all of Sherburne County, all of Minnesota, all of the United States, all of North America, all of the globe. I want the spiritual climate to change. I want light to push back darkness. And Jesus prays that that would happen as we have complete unity based out of the love we have together. Throughout the series, 
And we've been talking about Jesus serving, Jesus serving in practical ways, Jesus serving by sending his Holy Spirit, Jesus serving uh, by giving us peace, and now Jesus serving by praying for us. And yet we remember that when Jesus did that, he said that as he served, that he hoped his followers would go and do likewise. And so we talked about how we would serve practically. We talked about how we serve and testify with the Spirit of God in us. We talked last week about how we would serve full of peace. And you may be asking the question, okay, based on Jesus praying for us, how are we going to serve? Serve how? What's our response? Serve how? The simplest conclusion, pray. It's actually a service to pray for people. Jesus serves us by praying for us. Pray for people. Pray for your kids. Pray for your family. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your leaders, pray for your workers, pray for your neighborhood. I know many of you pray for me. It's one of the greatest acts of service you do on my behalf is pray for me. One of the ways we serve is by praying. Maybe a little more blunt and clear from the message this morning from what Jesus prayed. Here's how we can serve. Be in complete unity in Christ. So that, Jesus says, we would be put in complete unity in Christ so that the world would know about Christ and about God's love for them. If we want to serve the world, this is what Jesus prays we would do. And we cannot do it in our own power. We will always want to make camps. Our flesh will always desire we's and they's. It requires a move of God. Are we open, personally and collectively as a church, to a move of God in our lives that creates complete unity so that the world can see and know God's love? I'm hopeful we are. And I'm hopeful that it happens and that we respond with obedience to it, individually and collectively, so that the spiritual climate of ourselves, of our church, of our community, and of the world is changed because of it. Would you pray with me that that would be true? God, it is easy for me personally, for us collectively, to want to divide into camps of who we agree with on some of the smaller tangential kinds of things. And yet in the midst of that, would you please, by a work only you can do, give us hearts of unity on the gospel of Jesus Christ and on eternity being about knowing you through Christ. And as we have unity on that, form it into complete unity so that we, while disagreeing, don't create camps of we and they while we instead operate under your protection, sanctified by you, filled with your joy, so that the world around us can see and know your love and Christ sent on their behalf. We pray that you would do that and that it would begin to change the spiritual climates of our heart, that it would put darkness out of our heart and bring more light to them, that it would change the spiritual climates of our homes, of our neighborhoods, of our schools or workplaces or wherever we spend our days, of our communities, of our state, of our country, ultimately of the whole world. Unite your followers in complete unity so that the world would see and know of your love. We pray, knowing it requires you at work, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go, just a few brief reminders. First, if you want to give towards our benevolent fund, there's a box up the stairs at the top of door B or down by the church offices. You can give to meet the needs of those in our church or our community through that. We'd also love if you'd be willing to connect with each other. You may see somebody here you don't know and you choose to introduce yourself to them. You may see people you know and you choose to extend a handshake or start a conversation. Or you may be here and think, I'm willing to do that, but I have no idea what I would want to say to somebody. Well, I'll give you something just based on Jesus's prayer for us. You can say to anybody in the room, if you're willing to connect with them, just let them know. Jesus wants them to have the fullness of his joy. No matter who you're talking to, Jesus wants them to have the fullness of his joy. If you're willing, connect with somebody before you leave. Grace and peace to you. You are dismissed.